May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our freedom. Amen. Today is the feast day, the great feast day of Christ the King, the culmination and the conclusion of the entire liturgical year, which began the first Sunday of Lent, which I believe um, the bishop was visiting here the first Sunday of Lent. And now we're going to begin our next year with a slate of new bishop candidates and a new bishop. And our next liturgical year begins next Sunday with the first Sunday of Advent. And I am personally very excited to be experiencing my first Advent and Christmas with you all in this beautiful space with all the angels who join us for worship. We might consider today, Christ the King Sunday, to be our parish's patronal feast day because we as a parish are named after Christ. We're not St. John's, we're not St. Sebastian's, we're not St. Albans, we are Christ Church. A few days ago, many of us gathered here for a Thanksgiving Eucharist, followed by a wonderful, delicious Thanksgiving feast in the Heritage Room, primarily by Thomas and Sanford. And we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the day our founder, Thomas Walsh, wrote a letter to the Humboldt Times expressing his desire and his intention to build an Episcopal church in Eureka, California. And I read Thomas Walsh's original letter in its entirety on Thanksgiving, and I want to read a small portion of it today on Christ the King Sunday, because in it, Thomas Walsh explains why he wanted this church to be named Christ Church. It was on November 21st, 1868. So this year it was Thanksgiving Eve. On November 21st, 1868, Thomas Walsh Esquire wrote, I propose, and then he used these two letters, DV. I propose DV. Does anybody know what that means? It's Latin. Apparently this was used in the 19th century. Latin for Deo Volente, which means God willing. I propose, DV, I propose God willing, erecting an Episcopal church in Eureka to be called Christ Church. I think a most appropriate name, he says, Christ being the means, the faith, and the door to heaven. I propose doing this with the assistance of the good people of this place, knowing their liberality heretofore. Definitely sounds very 19th century. And that was a 19th century way of saying, I believe this will happen. I believe this will come to fruition because people in Eureka, especially the Episcopalians in Eureka, are very generous. That's their liberality. It was important to Thomas Walsh that our church be called Christ Episcopal Church because Christ, as he says, is our means, our access, our door to heaven. And because Christ is the king of heaven and earth. And because Christ longs to be the king of all our hearts. And we hear that often. But what does that mean? What does it mean for Christ to be the king of our hearts? I invite us to look for some clues in the gospel reading appointed for this feast day, a reading from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And our reading begins, just to give some context, it begins after Jesus has been betrayed by his disciple, Judas. He's just been arrested by a cohort or a detachment of Soldiers, which is about 600. They needed 600 soldiers to arrest him. He's been interrogated by the high priest Caiaphas while being slapped in the face, all while his close friend and disciple Peter has denied having anything to do with him several times. 
The Jewish leaders hand Jesus over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who has the power through Caesar to execute Jesus in one of the most horrific, violent, and humiliating ways. And that's when our reading begins, with Pilate summoning Jesus and asking him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers, My kingdom is not from this world. And what does this mean? This does not mean that Jesus' reign is purely heavenly, leaving earth to stew in its own toxic juice. Anglican bishop and New Testament scholar N.T. Wright explains, This saying, my kingdom is not from this world, is not about the kingdom's location, but about its character. The kingdom is not the sort that advances by violence, like the Roman Empire. It will come on earth as in heaven because, N.T. Wright says, it is about truth. Pilate doesn't know what the truth is. Pilate doesn't know that there can be a kingdom without violence. Pilate asks, so are you a king? Jesus responds and says, I came into this world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens. To my voice. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. If you open up your Pew Bibles to John chapter 18, which I believe is on page 987, you can read what the lectionary unfortunately leaves out, which is the next verse, verse 38, John 18, 38, on page 987, in which Pilate asks Jesus the question that he's probably most well-known for, this infamous question. What does Pilate ask? What is truth? It's actually a great question, and I admire Pilate for asking it. But unfortunately, if you keep reading, Pilate fails to stick around long enough to listen to Jesus' response. After saying this, he goes off to speak to the Jewish leaders. And then, after some more discussion with the Jewish leaders, he orders his soldiers to flog Jesus. Soldiers who then dress him up mockingly in a purple robe. Insult him. Strike him on the face. Crown him with a crown of thorns. And then strip him naked and crucify him. And I wonder... What would have happened if Pilate just stayed a few moments and listened to Jesus respond? I wonder what Jesus would have said to Pilate if Pilate remained with him and genuinely listened after asking the question, what is truth? Maybe Jesus would have said what he said early on in John, in John 14, 6, when he says, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the access to the Father. I am the door to heaven. Or maybe Jesus would have simply sat in silence and looked Pilate in the eyes with love and compassion. And maybe that's why Pilate left, because he was a little too uncomfortable with the silence, as many of us can be. Maybe Jesus was inviting Pilate to pause and to take a breath. And listen in the silence for the answer to his question, what is truth? Have you ever asked God a question and spent time actually listening in silence for some kind of response? Silence is, after all, God's first language. Everything else is a poor translation. Contemplative author and Catholic priest Henry Nouwen asked, Have you tried to spend a whole hour doing nothing but listening to the voice that dwells deep in your heart? It is not easy to enter into the silence and reach beyond the many boisterous and demanding voices of our world and to discover there 
that still small voice, that small intimate voice saying, you are my beloved child. On you, my favor rests. Still, if we dare to befriend the silence, Henry Nouwen says, we will come to know that voice. Jesus said, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The voice that Christ invites us to listen to is the divine voice that says, you are my beloved child, on you my favor rests. It is the inner voice of love. And it is the ultimate truth. It's the answer to Pilate's question. If Pilate would have entered into the silence and reached beyond the many boisterous and demanding voices of his world, he would have heard it. Can we hear it? Can you hear it? When we talk about Christ as the king of our hearts, we're talking about that voice of love reigning supreme in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. All the other boisterous and demanding voices may still be there. But when Christ is the king of our hearts, those voices become almost irrelevant as the divine voice of love holds court. This voice of love does not rule by force or violence. At the same time, the voice of love is not a therapeutic self-esteem boost meant to just pat us on the back and make us feel good about ourselves and tranquilize us. Archbishop Desmond Tutu described the voice of love when he said, God loves me as I am to help me become all that I have in me to become. Those who think this opens the door for moral laxity have obviously never been in love, for love is demanding. Love is far more demanding than law. In the words of the English hymn writer Isaac Watts, whose feast day happens to be today, he's the godfather of hymnody, this love is so amazing, so divine, that it demands my soul, my life, my all. At the 8 a.m. service, uh, Pastor Dan Price was here with his wife, and Pastor Dan Price uh, was a, is a scholar of one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth, Protestant theologian. And his presence reminded me of this story of Karl Barth Towards the end of his life, he visits uh, the U.S. He was from Germany. And someone had the boldness to ask him how he would sum up all of his theology. He wrote tomes of theology. He wrote millions of words, thousands of pages of dense theology. Somebody asked him to sum up his entire message. And he said, I would sum it all up with these words. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's it. So I love how our liturgical year concludes with Christ the King when we're reminded of this voice of love. And we invite this voice of love to reign supreme in our hearts. That's really what it's all about. When we let this voice of love rule our hearts and our homes our church and our communities, we begin to manifest on earth the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven among us and within us. And when we let this voice of love rule, we become a powerful and hope-filled sign of the truth that we celebrate today. The truth that Christ is indeed King. Amen. Amen.